As many of you know, my name is Joella Rowland, and I'm a staff editor and the incoming executive symposium and manuscripts editor for the Journal of Business and Technology Law. Today's final panel will look at legal issues surrounding concussions and analyze how the legal profession views the current problems that sports organizations face when attempting to handle various types of concussion injuries. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the moderator for the third and final panel of the day, Professor Marley Weiss. Professor Weiss is, the widely is widely recognized as an expert in the field of labor and employment law. While being on the faculty at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law, Professor Weiss served as the law school's teams as the coach for the law school teams participating in the American Bar Association section of labor and employment law trial advocacy competition. She teaches courses on employment law, labor law, torts, and public international law, among others. Prior to becoming an associate professor of law at Cary Law, Professor Weiss served as associate general counsel of the United Auto Workers, where she handled a wide variety of labor relations, equal employment, employee benefits, and employment law matters. In addition to serving as a professor of law at Maryland for over 15 years, Professor Weiss has served as a visiting professor and visiting Fulbright lecturer at Itvos Lauren University in Budapest, Hungary. A graduate of Harvard Law School and Barnard College, Professor Weiss is the 2013 recipient of the Paul Stephen Miller Scholarship Award, which honors her scholarship and other contributions to the field of labor and employment law and to its researchers, teachers, and practitioners across the nation. Professor Weiss was the first chair of the National Advisory Committee regarding the North American Agreement on Labor Cooperation. She served as secretary-elect and secretary of the American Bar Association Section of Labor and Employment Law and a past co-chair of the Section's Committee on International Labor and Employment Law. In addition, she serves as co-chair of the Collaborative Research Network 8 Labor Rights of the Law and Society Association and is a member of the advisory board of the Peggy Browning Fund, as well as a fellow of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers. Professor Weiss has co-written the books International Labor Law, Cases and Materials on Workers' Rights in the Global Economy and Documentary Supplement to International Labor Law, Cases and Materials on Workers' Rights in the Global Economy and written chapters in numerous other books. Her work has been published in the Maryland Law Review, Chicago Kent Law Review, Maryland of Journal International Law and the Maryland Journal of Race, Religion and Gender and Class. Hopefully we can be next. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Marley Weiss. Wow, after that introduction, I am really embarrassed. Thank you very much. Um, I, I actually plan to start by introducing all four of our panelists uh, so that we can continue without having to break up the flow of presentations here. Um, and we're actually seated, this is purely great good luck, um, from the right to the left uh, with Mr. Cy Smith, who is going to be the first presenter, um, to be followed by Dean Gary Roberts, who will be the second presenter. And then uh, over here next to me, we have Professor Russell Versteeg. Did I say that right? Yes, thank you. Um, and after him will be John Colhane. So I'm just going to say a little bit about each one of them, and I apologize in advance. Uh, if I'd had any idea that my own bio was going to be that lengthy, uh, I probably wouldn't have done what I did, but I've edited all the bios uh, in the interest of having more time for conversation. So it isn't that I'm really a hog and wanted a very lengthy bio of myself, notwithstanding my great appreciation for it. Um, so starting with Cy Smith, uh, he is a partner in the Baltimore office of Zuckerman Spader LLP. His work as a trial lawyer often puts him in the spotlight, most recently for his representation of retired NFL players who received multiple concussions during their careers, only to be shortchanged by the league's pension plan. Mr. Smith's work for football retirees began in 2005 when he helped the family of the late Pittsburgh Steelers great, Mike Webster, win a multi-million dollar judgment in retroactive benefits and other relief from the Burt Bell and Pete Rozelle NFL player retirement plan. 
The case was the first ever win against the NFL pension plans and paved the way for today's public litigation and legislative scrutiny of the benefits available to retired players, which you no doubt have all heard and read a lot about in the press, on ESPN, and so on and so forth. Mr. Smith testified before the U.S. House Judiciary Committee and has appeared on HBO and ESPN to discuss the NFL's pension plan. Um, with more than a quarter century's experience as a trial lawyer, Mr. Smith has represented plaintiffs and defendants in complex securities, class action, sports law, products liability, professional malpractice, and business tort cases, not to mention ERISA litigation, which is what he was involved in with the NFL Players Association. Um, his wide variety of plaintiff's cases includes medical, legal, and accounting malpractice claims, shareholder derivative suits, securities matters, and defamation claims, resulting in a number of multi-million dollar verdicts and settlements. He also has represented defendants in a similar range of complex civil litigation matters. Mr. Smith received his BA from Dartmouth College and his JD from the University of Virginia School of Law, where he was the recipient of the Robert E. Goldstein Award, uh, so we will all look forward to hearing from him first. He will be followed by Dean Gary Roberts, who is currently Dean Emeritus and the Gerald L. Bepco Professor of Law at the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. Uh, he served as the Dean of the Indiana University McKinney School of Law from the summer of 2007 until this past summer of 2013. Uh, Dean Roberts was a faculty member at Tulane Law School for 24 years before that, uh, where he directed the sports law program. He has taught sports law, antitrust law, labor law, and business enterprises. He is a recognized expert in sports law, has published articles and book chapters on antitrust, labor, and other issues in the sports industry, and has co-authored the leading case book on sports law. Dean Roberts has served as president of the Sports Lawyers Association and as chairman of the AALS, that's the Association of American Law School Sports Law Section. He is currently an officer and board member of the Sports Lawyers Association and is editor-in-chief of its monthly online newsletter, The Sports Lawyer. He has served for many years on committees for the NCAA. Uh, he is also a certified commercial and sports arbitrator with the American Arbitration Association. He is a founding member and member of the board of directors for the International Association of Sports Professionals and Executives. After he speaks, Professor Russell Versteeg, seated next to me, will <coughs> present. Uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Versteeg teaches copyright law, sports law, trademarks, and unfair competition, law in the ancient world, and UCC sales. His areas of interest include intellectual property and legal history. He is the author of Law, Technology, and Professional Basketball, Sports Law Cases and Materials, and a cost-benefit analysis of a pole vaulting helmet requirement, why the NFHS and other rulemaking bodies should not adopt such a rule. Um, Professor Versteeg received his AB from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and his JD from the University of Connecticut School of Law. And finally, batting cleanup for us, will be Professor John Culhane. John Culhane is Professor of Law and Director of the Health Law Institute at Widener University School of Law and a contributing writer for Slate Magazine. He is co-author of the recently released Same-Sex Legal Kit for Dummies, the editor and a contributor to Reconsidering Law and Policy Debates, a Public Health Perspective, and the author of some three dozen law review articles on a wide range of topics, including the rights of LGBT couples, compensation of victims of mass disasters, the public health implications of such disparate issues as, for today, sports-related concussions, also bullying, another sports-related, perhaps, issue, same-sex marriages, coming closer to sports relation, gun policy and vaccine compensation policy, and a range of tort law issues, some of which we will speak about today. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me turn the podium over to Cy Smith.
Thank you, Professor Weiss. Thank you to everyone. Friday afternoon, good Friday afternoon, or as we say in Baltimore, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, so th there's a tendency in law, as in many other fields of you know, academic study, to think that there are you know, broad, widely determined uh, waves of history. Things are you know, determined by these big waves. Everything proceeds in a very orderly fashion. Um, but I think we all know as we, we move on in life, that's not really the case. And the subject that brings us here today in 2014 is a subject that would not possibly have brought us together in 2004 or 1999 or any other five or ten year interval before that. And there's an element of randomness uh, in human life and in public affairs. And the thing that makes us very focused today on concussions in sports, disability in sports, et cetera, can in large part be shaped or traced back to a somewhat random event, which is uh, the life and career of Mike Webster, who played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Pause for people to you know, boo and hiss about the Steelers because we're here in Baltimore. Uh, but Mike Webster's case uh, really, I think, coincidentally, m maybe it would have happened with someone else, but Mike Webster's case is the largely sort of random event that led to today's scrutiny of this whole, this whole thing. So let's talk a little bit about Mike uh, Webster. And if I had gotten my PowerPoint slides together, we put a big slide of him up there wearing his mid-1970s, uh, 1980s uh, Steelers uniform. So Mike died in 2002 at the age of 50. Uh, he was born back in 1952 in Tomahawk, Wisconsin. He grew up on a 640-acre potato farm. And though he did not play football until high school, he received a scholarship to the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and after he played there, he played professionally for the Steelers for 15 seasons, from 1974 until 1988, the vast majority of them at center in the Steelers' offensive line. Uh, this is a guy who, by all accounts, endured thousands, thousands of hits to his head and multiple concussions. But in his entire medical file in the National Football League, not a single concussion was ever documented. All kinds of other things, contusions, sprains, and breaks, and pulls, and all this stuff, not a single concussion. During one stretch, this is a guy who is known as Iron Mike. He played for six consecutive seasons without missing a single offensive down. He played in 177 consecutive games. Again, not a single concussion. So 245 career games, the most ever by a center, the fifth most in NFL history. And this is a team that was wildly successful. They won four Super Bowls in the 1970s. Uh, he was elected captain of the Steelers during three of those four Super Bowl years. He was all pro nine times. At the end of his career, after the Steelers, he played for two years for the Chiefs. And at least then, and I don't know if this is still true today, I, don't, I understand we have a, a former pro football player in your class here at the University of Maryland. I don't think that person is just looking around here. It doesn't, is that correct? So is the center still considered to be uh, one of the most intelligent people? Is these the guy who calls offensive line alignments? Is that still true? Okay, well, that was true back then, and with Terry Bradshaw, he probably was the most important, <laughs> the most intelligent guy. So, you know, this is a guy who is highly intelligent, and then we're going to talk about what happened to him after playing pro football. After he was elected, inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, he was elected to the NFL's all-time team in 2000, died in 2002, as I said, of heart disease. So, the center position, in addition to being, uh, as we were just uh, reminded, you know, the guy who's got to call the plays, a highly intelligent player, it's one of the most exposed and unprotected positions on the field. And the reason is he's got to hold the ball down on the ground, right? And then he's got, he can't uh, use his arms to protect himself you know, what, immediately as play starts. But it used to be a lot worse than that because until 1977, there was a very standard play among defensive linemen, which was called the head slap. The head slap consisted of starting the play, if you're a defensive lineman, by slamming your, your arm, your, your hand, your open hand, against the helmet of the offensive lineman, particularly the center, because he had to be down. Uh, and that was legal until 1977. You had guys like Deacon Jones, who was huge in those days, close to 300 pounds. And one time, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but one of these defensive linemen, he broke his hand, and so he had a, a cast on his hand 
that extended up into his arm. And normally that, you know, they take the cast off after a couple weeks. He kept it on the whole season because it generated a bigger bang when he hit the offensive lineman in the head. So that's how the play would start. But even after 1977, when it was outlawed, it was still in common use in the NFL. The reason it was outlawed was actually concern at a very sort of vestigial reptile brain uh, level that maybe it wasn't such a good idea to have people getting smacked in the head by someone who weighed 300 pounds. So even without the head slap, if you're an NFL center or a lineman, you would be, remained exposed today in line play, <coughs> up and down the offensive defensive line, you remain exposed to major high speed impacts every single play of the game. That's untrue of any other position on the field. So as one neutral physician who was chosen by the NFL's pension plan to evaluate Mike Webster's application for disability benefits said, he said, quote, all football players have a history of multiple head injuries, unquote. So if we go back to 2004, you know, this was not as well recognized at the time, but it was recognized at some level because the risk of brain damage to NFL players from game contact was noted inside their pension plan documents as far back as 1998. When the plan document, which under federal pension law is the document that governs the terms, that creates the terms of the pension plan itself, the plan document provided that you could provide total and permanent disability benefits for a player who had a psychological psychiatric disorder that was caused by or related to a head injury or injuries sustained by a player arising out of league football activities, i.e. repetitive concussions. So it was known as far back as that. And I'm sure other uh, speakers have spoken today about the fact that in uh, boxing, in pro boxing, it was well known at least as part of the, as, as far back as the early part of the 20th century, punch drunk syndrome was well recognized then. So what happened to Mike uh, after he stopped playing pro football in 1990? Well, uh, he wasn't able to hold a steady job. He was homeless. He slept in his car. He was reclusive. His marriage broke up. He became estranged from his children, from his wife. He lost money in a series of bad investments. In 1999, he pled guilty to forging prescriptions for Ritalin, which he used to treat himself for some of the symptoms of these uh, concussions, his NFL brain injuries. And because he had a very private personality, because he was a very prideful man, uh, he was unable to admit to himself and to others that he was facing these difficulties. And so the, the fact and the extent of his difficulties remained a secret to many for years, even after his retirement from football. But he finally applied for a disability pension in 1999 from the NFL's Burt Bell Pete Rozelle NFL Player Retirement Plan. Now this retirement plan is a collectively, that's five minutes to go, okay. It is a collectively bargained pension plan between the owners, the pro football owners, and the NFLPA, the union that represents pro football players. The benefits are highest if you have an injury which is directly related to football and prevents you from working. And all of the doctors who looked at Mike agreed that he had a disability that was a direct result from playing pro football and that he had been disabled since 1991. But they gave him a much smaller pension based on the assumption that his injury was not directly related to football. They assumed he wasn't disabled until 1999 when he applied. Now, that led to a lawsuit we won here in Baltimore that was affirmed in the Fourth Circuit. Um, and th that all happened in 2005, 2006. And then Congress got into the act in 2007, and then things started to happen. People said, well, it's probably not just pro football. What about college football? And what about youth football? And what about lacrosse? And what about hockey? I have a son who plays hockey and has had a couple of concussions. Um, and it's not just uh, disability pension claims. Maybe there are tort claims involved and so on. But how we got here is really determined in part by chance, because Mike Webster was a guy who had a very, very serious disability but the NFL chose not to treat it as one. And I'll wind up my remarks now, but maybe elaborate a little bit more on the question of why did it take so long? Why did it take so long? And I think there are two answers to that. And I wasn't here earlier today. Maybe some of these have been discussed. But the, the first one is a very sort of tactical one that, uh, as this one doctor said, every NFL player, 
I hope you're an exception to that, sir. But anyone who's played uh, you know, football at a high level for a long time, especially on the lines, has likely had a number of concussions. And if you look at the owner's incentives, you know, these can be very expensive disabilities. The highest disability level under this pension plan is $200,000 a year and change. Uh, and so if you've got 1,000 people, even for a $9 billion industry, which is what the NFL is, uh, that's a lot of money. The players, it's a little harder to understand. And I, I really, this is not my original insight. It was actually a labor lawyer who told me about this. Uh, they said, you know, think about the NFL players union. Think about the, the fact that the average player career lasts three and a half or four years. Think about other types of unions like the UAW that Professor Weiss used to be uh, associate general counsel at. In the average union, you have people who are just starting off in their career, people in the middle of their careers, people at the end. And so the interests of all of those people are going to be represented when they go to the bargaining table. In the NFL, you've got a lot of, for the most part, very young guys. Some guys are a little bit older, but you're pretty much out of the league by the time you're in your mid-30s. A young guy, okay, is going to think that he's invincible. He's been invincible in high school. He's been invincible in college. Now he's in the NFL, okay? He is in the game, you know, the, the national and international game. It's very hard to focus on the fact that you might be out of the league in the very next play until it happens. And so for that reason, the most of the incentive is to go towards salary, not towards disability pension benefits. And there's less of a focus, at least one theory goes, on that in terms of the union. So that, that's sort of a tactical reason. What's the bigger picture here? The bigger picture here is that in the 1920s, you know, boxing was the biggest pro sport in the United States. And it is not today. There is, you know, boxing, pro boxing still exists. There's tough man competition, ultimate fighter, all that stuff. But it's not the sort of across the board popular sport that it once was. And the reason for the most part is that people came to realize that boxing was a blood sport. The people who boxed for a long time were going to become punch drunk and all that sort of stuff. And you could not get, in the same way that you have grandmothers in Baltimore wearing you know, Ray Rice jerseys, you couldn't get grandmothers to sign up and say, I'm going to go to pro boxing bouts in the 1960s and the 70s and today. And the biggest fear that pro football has, the biggest fear they have, is that pro football will go the way of boxing. That people will decide there's just a big, there's not much of a distinction between pro football and boxing. Now, you can argue that there is, that there, there isn't, uh, but that's the biggest fear they have. And by stalling for a long time and only belatedly recognizing the link between pro football and concussions, the NFL was really, in a sense, fighting for time in order to preserve its way of doing business. We can talk a little bit more, I see my time is up, we can talk a little bit more about how successful they've been, what changes there have been, but those are the two biggest things that were going on. Mike Webster's case was the first, and there have been a series afterwards. The, the way has been paid for lots of other things. But it's a, an element of chance that led us to this point in the national discussion, chance that led to Mike and his family getting some fair, some treatment, some fair treatment from this, and for other players as well. So I'll be happy to, to talk about this further and open the door for Professor Roberts. Well, as a, an Indianapolis Colts season ticket holder, I was going to tell some jokes about that, but I've been warned that if I want to get out of Baltimore in one piece, I better, uh, better refrain from doing that. So we'll turn to the topic at hand. Um, and about 80% of what I was planning to say was already said this morning by uh, Dion Collar, who did a magnificent job, I think, of summarizing a lot of the legal issues and the, and the legal perspective. So what I'm going to do, uh, kind of winging it here, is to just walk us through some of the litigation and to give some sense of perspective as to what's going on out there in the courts. Uh, there are a, a whole bunch of lawsuits, and I think it would be helpful to just summarize them quickly, talk about some of the critical issues in those lawsuits, and then step back, if I still have a couple minutes left, to uh, uh, just raise some big picture issues of what all this means from 30,000 feet. Um, today there are, uh, I can't even count them, but there are literally dozens of lawsuits against uh, sports entities of one kind or another involving uh, head injuries or former head injuries that have led to various kinds of diseases and emotional and, and um, 
other, other types of physical problems. Um, I think it's easiest to think of these if, if you categorize them. Uh, so for example, there are a number of suits I'll talk about in just a second against leagues and governing bodies, the NFL, the NCAA, organizations that make the rules and that regulate the operation of the sport. Uh, they're not the organizations that directly supervise or employ the athletes, but they basically run the industry. Uh, there are a lot of actions against teams, especially at the college level. Uh, at the professional level, as I'll mention, uh, workman's comp bars most of the, of the litigation. With one exception, in the state of Missouri, there's a, there's a case that I'll mention a little later as well, brought by several former Kansas City Chiefs players against the Chiefs. They're the only NFL team that is facing any litigation because all the other teams are protected by their state workers' comp laws. Uh, but colleges are being sued right and left by uh, former players. Um, and because the colleges have chosen in their wisdom not to allow their players to consider themselves as employees, they don't get the benefit of workers' comp laws. Um, and then the third group of defendants are the um, equipment providers, most specifically in this uh, discussion, helmet providers or helmet manufacturers. And these three different categories of defendants uh, are facing suits by former players, with one exception, a current player, uh, at different levels. We focused a lot this morning on the youth and scholastic levels, high school, junior high school, and youth football and other sports. Uh, but obviously, a lot of these lawsuits that are getting most of the attention are at the college level and at the professional level. So when you kind of do a grid of what category any particular lawsuit falls into, it helps to focus uh, the issues that are, that are being uh, raised in those cases. Um, just a couple of points to make in passing quickly. Most of the cases uh, focus on and are, that are getting the most attention focus on football, uh, American football, not what the rest of the world calls football. But in fact, uh, there are significant issues, and we've heard this all morning, that, that there are many, many sports that face these issues. And while it's quite true that football is the one that seems to be under the most attack today, uh, and I think uh, Sai is absolutely right, the great fear that, uh, uh, that the NFL and, and others who are, whose careers are built around the sport of football have, is that it will go the way of boxing, that it will become a sport that mothers will not let their, their kids play, uh, that uh, will, be, will be seen as, as uh, the equivalent of a modern-day gladiatorial fight and that people will stop uh, buying tickets at uh, $250 a piece and paying $1,000 for the Super Bowl and what have you. And their kids won't be buying uh, Colts or Ravens jerseys and what have you. Um, and so um, uh, football is the, is the primary focus of these discussions, but the same kinds of issues could very well apply in ice hockey, field hockey, uh, what we call soccer. And just yesterday, there was a lawsuit filed by a woman cross-country runner at Stanford. Cross-country runner? And, but she actually has brought a lawsuit against the NCAA, claiming that she has suffered concussions. She must have fallen, or somebody who ran past her must have elbowed her in the head or something but she says she has suffered concussions while running cross country at Stanford and that the NCAA has failed to provide adequate training for coaches, provide adequate rules for how she should be dealt with and what have you. So almost any sport uh, runs the risk of, of having the problems that football uh, has. Most of the cases uh, involve men, but we've heard that female athletes have the same risks and the same problems. And in fact, um, we heard this morning that, uh, in fact, when women suffer concussions, uh, the effects can be even more acute uh, for reasons I don't know, but we could speculate on. But this, the problems are, are problems for women as much as men. And the final point I would make is that while we often talk about concussions, uh, the long-term effects that lead to the types of problems that that Mike Webster and so many others have had do not just come from concussions, whatever those may be, 
but from a, a repeated series of subconcussive trauma. Uh, and uh, in, in many, many sports, uh, players are constantly being hit in the head, and they may not suffer concussions as a result of it, but if you get hit in the head enough, you're going to have long-term problems arise, and litigation has not really focused on that, and the sports haven't really focused on that. We're so focused on concussions and these, these sudden blunt traumas that cause people to kind of get fuzzy and woozy, and you can look in their eyes and see that there's an obvious problem. But what do you do with a sport or a situation where athletes are constantly getting smashed in the head, they don't get concussions, but there's gradual brain damage going on there. So that's a, another thing to, to, to think about as, as we're talking about this subject. Okay, what are the lawsuits? Just real quickly. Uh, the big one against the NFL is this lawsuit up in Philadelphia, which is a consolidation of a large number of separately brought lawsuits. Um, the Arrington, or not Arrington, that's the college one. Easterling is the primary lawsuit that was brought. It was a class action suit brought in Philadelphia. Uh, and then there was another class action suit that's called the Hardman case. Uh, those two suits were consolidated in Philadelphia along with um, multi-plaintiff suits. Uh, Maxwell, Pear, and Barnes were consolidated in Philadelphia as well. And then there were several single plaintiff lawsuits that were brought around the country that were also consolidated in Philadelphia. So we've got over 4,000 class members uh, in uh, this lawsuit up in Philadelphia. That's the case that you've all read about. There was a tentative $765 million settlement that was reached with the plaintiff's lawyers uh, that uh, Judge Anita Brody has uh, preliminarily said she would not approve of, uh, but she left open uh, the uh, opportunity for the, the parties to come in and persuade her uh, that the uh, settlement amount would, would be sufficient to adequately compensate all the class members who might be able to bring claims. Uh, there was also a concern that she had uh, that uh, the NFL would not uh, consider um, settling the case unless all the plaintiffs agreed to waive their right to sue the NCAA. And the N NFL's concern was is that if the NFL settled, the players would then turn around, take their money, and then they'd go and sue the NCAA because everybody in the NFL also played in college at one point in time. And the NCAA would then join the NFL and the NFL would be right back in the soup. So they're not going to settle unless the, the players agree to waive the right to sue the NCAA. And that was also a concern. Um, in addition to the um, uh, Easterling and all the other consolidated suits, there are a number of lawsuits that have been brought after the settlement was announced by play, former players who are not happy with that settlement. And so we've got a, a lawsuit brought by Randall L. and three other former players in the, the Southern District of New York Federal Court. We've got Mike Webster's estate, who's brought a, a state lawsuit in the Superior Court in Los Angeles. And Craig Morton, former Dallas Cowboys quarterback, has brought a federal uh, district court lawsuit in San Francisco. Uh, and there are a couple of others that, that I just haven't listed because I'm running out of time, but the point is is that there's a lot of litigation out there. Uh, and I guess the former players have heard about the problems of law students getting jobs and they're starting single-handedly to solve it because there are an awful lot of lawyers who are being dragged into this. And then there is the suit brought by the five former Kansas City Chiefs who are suing only the team, and they can do that because uh, Two minutes already? That was the fastest three minutes on the planet. Um, okay, the, because in, in Missouri, there's an exception from the workers' comp law for um, uh, what, what is it called? Occupational diseases, which the players claim uh, this is. Uh, and there's a lawsuit now against the National Hockey League, the Lehman suit. There is litigation that the NFL is having with its insurance companies over who will ultimately have to pay for any damages. And that's a real circus because there's dueling lawsuits in California and New York. Uh, and then there's a class action suit bought by a number of former NFL players against Rydell, the, the helmet manufacturer. It's a products liability suit. And then there was an interesting suit filed just two weeks ago by a former Lions running back, 
uh, named Javed Best, who played for the Detroit Lions for three years from 2011 through 2013. He was cut. He's, he's filed a lawsuit saying, I don't have any of the symptoms that any, all these other plaintiffs have, but I had a couple of concussions in college and a few in the pros, and someday I'm going to have these symptoms, and so I need to have a fund created so that when these symptoms do occur, uh, I'll be able to be covered by it, which is, if you stop and think about it, a really uh, uh, suit that is opening the door to all kinds of issues. And then, of course, in college, we've got the Arrington suit that has, uh, 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 is in Chicago. It's a, it's a consolidation of 10 separate lawsuits against the NCAA. Uh, and I could go on and list a whole bunch of other suits here that, uh, that with the time I've got, I, I won't do. Um, but the, the thing to note is that there are a number of interesting issues in these suits. Um, what, first of all, duty. Um, if you're an employer or if you're the college team that it players played for, you obviously have some degree of duty to, to be responsible and, and provide for safety. But what is the duty of the NCAA? Uh, a very interesting issue that uh, really hasn't been resolved. Does the NCAA have a duty to adopt rules that keep college players <coughs> safe, or does the duty of safety fall uh, solely on the school? I wouldn't want to be the NCAA's lawyer arguing that one, but I think it's a, at least from a law school standpoint, it's a perfectly legitimate question to raise. Um, the second is the assumption of risk defense, um, but that was talked about this morning. I'm not going to dwell on it anymore, but, but it is it's certainly a, an issue because most of these players certainly are aware that this is a violent sport and that there, there are risks involved. Third, what is the appropriate standard of care with respect to preseason baseline testing, training coaches and athletic trainers, availability of medical equipment and personnel on the sidelines, uh, coaching techniques, uh, playing field rules, uh, protocols with respect to returning to play, equipment standards, and there's a whole laundry list of things that a plaintiff can say, well, but they didn't do it properly. They didn't meet the standard of care with respect to this, and that's why I'm hurt. Cause in fact, uh, players suing the NFL, how do we know how much of their problem was incurred playing for the NFL and how much was incurred playing in college or in youth sports? It's, it's hard to, to separate that out. Uh, and finally, uh, at, at the pro level, and I, I guess I'll, I'll wrap it up uh, summarizing all this, with the collective bargaining overlay. One of the key defenses that the NFL has raised uh, is that the players um, uh, were represented by a union and that any claims that they have arising under the employer-employee relationship has to be arbitrated uh, pursuant to the collective bargaining agreement. And in any event, the standard of care that the NFL has to meet is one that is supposed to be collectively bargained and the players' interests are represented by their union the league doesn't have the responsibility for, for taking the lead on that. Uh, the players have argued that that's not a good argument. I think the players will lose on that one, but there's been periods like from 1987 through, or 1989 through 93 when the union was supposedly decertified, and the NFL, of course, denies that they did decertify, but uh, so for that four-year period, the collective bargaining defense goes away. Uh, but that's an interesting uh, overlay that exists as well. And I, I close with one, one comment, and that is, is that um, uh, I don't know if the tort system is the best system for dealing with this. I mean, Dion mentioned that this morning, and, and uh, uh, I, I would wax eloquent for a long time about the balance of interests here. Um, how much safety are we willing to pay for without compromising what society wants to see? Um, and and uh, should we do away with football? Uh, if we tried to do that, I think Texas would secede from the union. So uh, with, with that comment, um, I'll, I'll shut up and sit down. <laughs> okay. All I have to do is figure out how to get all this to work and I'll be in business. Here we go. Um, I want to start by, uh, actually, before I start into the slides, um, I want to talk a little bit about my family. Uh, my daughter, for her livelihood, is on the ski patrol at Park City Mountain Resort. Um, 
who's always telling me about new ways that people can injure themselves and is always telling me about new helmet technology. Um, when she's not going down the slopes or pulling other people down the slopes, she's riding her horse. And of course, we heard this morning that in terms of the volume of uh, cranial injuries, equestrian sports tops the list. Um, my son played high school lacrosse and to the best of my knowledge only suffered one concussion. Um, my brother uh, is the reason why I knew about concussions early on because we grew up in North Carolina and it almost never snows um, there, of course this year being the exception, but um, it snowed once and so he got out the sled and was going down a hill and saw a tree coming up and his first reaction was to put his head down. And so of course he hit his head on the tree. So that's how I learned about concussions. I think he came out okay, although he played center for the high school football team. And uh, I know he was the smartest one on the team because the reason he played center was because they were playing single wing and he was the only person they tried. He played guard at first. He was the only person on the team who could remember who he was supposed to center the ball to. If you know anything about the single wing, you have to know who you're uh, sending it to. But uh, then again, he chose to go to law school at Duke University, which made me really question his judgment. Um, <laughs> at any rate. Um, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring us really way down to earth here and uh, just talk about some very simple things. Um, I'm talking about product liability to a large degree. Uh, I'm going to say a couple words about negligence because that's come up earlier today. Uh, Steve Packman spoke about it. Professor Roberts just mentioned it. Um, I did a lot of work last year talking about or, or writing about assumption of risk. And if you haven't reviewed your torts notes, you might want to remember that there are at least, at least three different kinds of assumption of risk. One is express assumption of risk, you know, when people are signing waivers and that type of thing. There's also what's called primary implied assumption of risk and secondary implied assumption of risk. And the primary implied assumption of risk may be a viable um, defense for those of you who are interested in doing defense work. Uh, a couple of states, in particular Ohio and um, uh, California, have led the way essentially saying that in, in sports, um, primary assumption of risk is going to bar a lot of lawsuits because um, for dangers or risks that are inherent in the sport, um, the, they say the entities don't, uh, neither coaches, entities, officials, um, co-participants, owe a duty of reasonable care. In other words, negligence isn't the standard, but rather recklessness or intent um, <coughs> to injure would be the standard of care. So it's just a couple of footnotes to look ahead at. Um, so the primary topic uh, that I'm looking at today is, is product liability. What, and for those of you, again, I'm bringing it really, very low level down to earth, um, sort of taking notes in terms, of, um, in terms of maybe being a plaintiff's lawyer or a defendant's lawyer, here are a couple of the things uh, that you might look at. Um, sure enough, there are a lot of lawsuits that have brought, been brought against equipment manufacturers, in particular safety equipment manufacturers, because if a piece of safety equipment malfunctions, um, we know a tremendous amount of uh, damage can occur. Um, so uh, it's, it's very common to see these kinds of lawsuits brought, um, especially for the uh, jurisdictions that have adopted Section 402A of the Restatement, which again, I presume most of you are familiar with uh, from having been law students. Uh, this is strict liability. And um, of course, the, the major wave of product liability occurred in the uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s, and perhaps peaking in the 80s. Um, where, you know, just in a very straightforward manner, if you consider something like a helmet that malfunctions, um, the, the, product, the product manufacturer is likely to be brought to bear. Um, we saw at the Sochi Olympics, you saw that the helmet that cracked. Um, and we've known helmets, uh, just not every single helmet is going to be foolproof. Um, or as, uh, who was it, Boris Badenov used to say, it needs to be idiot proof. Um, to take care of him. Um, so yeah, product liability is a, is a viable theory under tort law in most states. Uh, the state that I teach in, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we have not adopted Section 402A. Um, so we tend to rely on commercial law and Section uh, 2-314 of the Uniform Commercial Code, 
um, which is the uh, warranty of merchantability. I'll have a few more things to say about that. Um, so with, uh, again, with strict product liability, there are a number of different ways that products can be deemed to be defective and therefore uh, a plaintiff may be able to recover. Um, the principal uh, three major ways that, uh, that the law, if you will, or that our experience has taught us um, uh, products may be defective are number one, manufacturing defects. Um, if something comes off the assembly line without the appropriate care, or without the screws being, uh, b being fastened properly or the fasteners uh, fastened properly, um, that may give rise to litigation, that may give rise to liability. Um, it's one of the reasons why when you open up your equipment, you'll see inspected by number 27 or whoever. You, know, you hope that there is a protocol, um, a plan B, if you will, someone inspecting all of the equipment. Think about the ski manufacturers, the people who manufacture bindings and that kind of thing. Yeah, you want to make sure that those, uh, that those things are functioning properly. So the manufacturing defects is one kind of way that a product could be defective. You could have a design defect. Uh, so the third restatement of torts um, and uh, apparently the modern trend is to treat design defects you know, the blueprints, the engineers perhaps having uh, made a mistake, as uh, using a, um, um, a negligence standard rather than a product liability standard. So that may be an exception, uh, an exception that, that is uh, really, um, if you will, um, on the rise that, that for um, uh, design defects, a different standard rather than strict liability may very well apply. And lastly, um, failure to warn. Um, which is why on the helmets and every piece of equipment you find um, warning labels, um, which almost get to the point of being um, silly, don't they? Um, it's sort of like you know, when you fly on an airplane, how often, you know, once you've flown on an airplane a few times, how much attention do you actually pay to the people who are telling you how to fasten your safety belt, how to inflate your Right, you get my point, is that, that after a while we tune those sorts of things out so that we see warning labels on everything and you wonder um, how, you know, how meaningful are warning labels um, actually. But those are the three traditional uh, means by which uh, products may be deemed defective under Section 402A. In addition to that, um, another, um, another path, another legal theory uh, that plaintiffs might use would be the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, commercial law theories. Um, in particular, um, you could breach an express warranty. Um, I'm going to talk about a case in a few minutes uh, 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 involving a motorcycle helmet, actually, where um, it's very likely the jury found a, a, a breach of the express warranty. This is where lawyers have to talk to the, to the marketing people in a really serious way because marketers want to tell you how great all of your equipment is and what wonderful things it can accomplish for you. Um, and so you have to toe the line pretty carefully because as, uh, as Attorney Pacman told us this morning, jurors are sympathetic. Jurors are looking at the, uh, the teenager in the wheelchair uh, who, who's paraplegic at this point, and they're ready to write checks because they know they're not writing them on their own checkbooks. Um, so you have to be sure that the folks who are doing the marketing for you are writing the express warranties in a way that it actually tells you what the product does and isn't just uh, touting what you hope it will do. Um, there's also two theories which if you've studied uh, the Uniform Commercial Code, maybe you know a little bit about the breach of, of the, uh, there are two implied warranties, a warranty of merchantability, which is essentially saying that the product is going to act the way that products like this are supposed to act. It's going to pass without objection in the trade, be a fair average quality, be fit for its ordinary purpose. And that's what we, most of us want our products to do. Um, however, when the helmet cracks or doesn't properly um, uh, dissipate the force in the way that it was designed to dissipate force, it may very well be such that uh, the warranty of merchantability um, is breached. Um, similarly, you could have an implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. Uh, this arises when the uh, buyer um, comes to the seller and the seller um, is aware or a reasonable person in the position of the seller ought to be aware of the particular need that the buyer has and the buyer relies on that. That, I think, is a warranty that probably really attaches a lot in youth sports um, or in, in something, again, I'll, I'm sorry to keep coming back to this, but something sort of like skiing where different 
um, uh, different ability levels may very well need different kinds of equipment. Um, so in, in situations where the sellers know that you have a novice or an intermediate skier, the kind of equipment that they may need may very well be different from the uh, kind of equipment that a more advanced uh, skier would need. Um, and um, I'm not going to go through every bit of this, I promise. Um, but yes, there, there are remedies uh, that are available. And one of the uh, things I'd like to mention specifically is 2-719, Section 3 of the Uniform Commercial Code, um, which does allow sellers to limit liability for breach. One of the things that they can do is they can say, well, look, we're not going to be liable for consequential damages, which would be medical costs and that type of thing, the sorts of costs that would flow from injuries. Um, we're, we, we'll repair or replace your product. We'll refund your money. We'll give you a new helmet. Um, and that doesn't go very far when the person's lying in the emergency ward or when they're uh, a paraplegic. Um, but fortunately, 2-7193 also says specifically that a disclaimer of liability for consequential damages is prima facie unconscionable when you're talking about um, personal injury. Um, so that's, uh, that's an important thing to, to remember. So you can try and disclaim the, those sorts of uh, uh, warranties, but it doesn't go very far. Um, let's see. One thing that I'm surprised that more plaintiffs don't uh, use as, a, uh, as an arrow in their quiver, I guess I'd say, is the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. Um, it's a federal act which applies to consumer products um, and it applies when there is a, quote, written warranty. Now, that's a, a term of art that's used um, in the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. Um, nevertheless, um, most of the time, when, if there's an express warranty, nine times out of ten, that will qualify as a written warranty under the act. And one of the best things for a plaintiff's attorney is that you can get attorney's fees. Um, and you don't have to talk to many uh, litigators before you realize that um, it, it, you speed negotiations along pretty rapidly when you explain to them, and they have to explain to their client that not only will you be asking for you know, damages, but you'll also be asking for attorney's fees, um, and they'll have to explain to their client why they're paying for the other side's um, lawyer. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole case because I don't have time, um, but I want to briefly mention this case. It, it appears in a number of different um, uh, commercial law textbooks. Uh, this is a, a very sad case, tragic case, where a young man in his early 20s uh, flipped over the handlebars of his uh, motorbike and was uh, paralyzed from the neck down. Uh, essentially, the C5 vertebra imploded when he landed directly on his head. So he actually didn't suffer cranial injuries, but rather broke his neck, and uh, that was the way um, that, he, uh, that he suffered the most serious injury. Um, in the interest of time, what I want to do is sort of just move forward quickly to point out one thing about express warranties. Um, in the express warranty language, uh, this is the way that the, uh, that the Moto 5 helmet was um, advertised, um, designed to absorb the force of a blow by spreading it over as wide of an area of the outer shell as possible. Um, this is, a, this is the uh, warranty under which apparently the jury felt that uh, Bell Sports had breached the warranty. Um, and I've often wondered how the, as a, as a drafter, as someone writing warranties, now not with the litigator's hat on, but with the drafter's hat on, how you might have changed that language so that there wouldn't have been a breach. Perhaps, and I tried to um, make this a little more, uh, highlight this a little bit, perhaps if it had said in accordance with current DOT standards and Snell Foundation certification requirements, because that was true, right? Did, did it, you know, spread the impact over as wide an area as possible? We know possibility could be more, but if you say in accordance with a certain level, a certain standard, perhaps that wouldn't have been uh, a breach. Similar, similarly, perhaps if you'd said as possible, given the current state of the art at the time of manufacture. Um, I honestly am just not certain. All right, so there's your quick and dirty look at uh, basic theories of liability uh, for products.
just trying to find my PowerPoint and then maybe it's here. Oh, there we go. It's a good place for it. Okay. Let's go to slideshow view. There it is. Over here. Uh, the beginning, I can do it this way too. That's a, it's much, I can hit F5? Yeah. Oh, there we go. It happened. It just happened. <laughs> Thanks for, for sticking around till what I hope is not the bitter end. I know from uh, my own law school, uh, students who are on the journal are pretty much required to be here. So I hope to make it worth your while independently of your requirement to sit there and listen. Uh, and the other promise I will make is that there are only 11 slides, so you can start counting down in your head as I go through these. <laughs> so, so this is slide one, and I'd like to thank uh, Joshua for, uh, for inviting me. I think this is a, has been a uh, great day, and I really appreciate being, uh, being invited to speak. So what I'm going to do is sort of the opposite of what you did, which is to sort of uh, you take off and go up to about 30,000 feet and to take a look at the issue from a public health point of view, which is how I like to look at most issues. Um, and we'll see if that generates light, heat, both, or neither. Okay, so the first question you might ask is, well, why are we looking at this from a public health point of view? And I guess my smart aleck response is because the CDC does, right? And if you look at the left side of the uh, slide there, you will see in miniature form a CDC poster on concussion that was generated to go out to uh, coaches and people working in youth sports. So the CDC has identified this as a public health issue. Doesn't necessarily mean we have to agree with them, but it's pretty good evidence. And the man on the right, you might recognize, whether you're a football fan or not, the commissioner of the NFL, who uh, has been seen speaking at the Harvard School of Public Health, among other places, about how concussions and other uh, traumatic head injuries, including subconcussive impacts, are indeed public health issues. Okay, so that's sort of by fiat why we would call it public health. Let's see if we can get a better reason for calling it public health. And in order to do that, I wanted to step back for a minute for those of you that may not think in public health terms to really think about why uh, concussions and other head traumas might count as public health. So we can start with the definition of public health, which is quite a broad one, generated in 1988 by the Institute of Medicine, which sounds so broad as to be almost meaningless, right? What society does collectively to assure the conditions for people to be healthy. But it's the collective part of that that really is kind of the linchpin of a public health approach, okay? So old school public health, we looked at things like sanitation, vaccination, quarantine, but a modern view of public health takes a much broader view. And what it does is to look at, right, all kinds of traumas, all kinds of events that uh, uh, cause harm to people on a societal level or a broad level. And Wendy Parmet, who's an influential public health law scholar at Northeastern University School of Law has said, that what we need to do is to look at particular populations and how various traumatic events, how, how various uh, risks uh, affect those populations. And uh, that's a good start at how to look at a question from a public health point of view. Well, you might ask, okay, well, there are lots of things that can be public health. Uh, you know, bullying I've written about, uh, domestic violence seen as a public health issue, uh, even such Supposedly boring things like seat belts and passive restraint systems also have a public health dimension. So what's the advantage? Well, when we label something a public health issue, what we do is suggest a range of interventions that target particular populations rather than discrete victims. So if you think about litigation, you might have one plaintiff, one defendant. Even in a class action, you've got a limited class of people suing another limited class of people. If you think about private health care, right, your interaction with your physician is uh, not a public health issue, but a private health issue. So uh, Wendy Parmet says we should look at different populations and recognize that we are members of different populations within the broad population. To make that more concrete, when you think about uh, concussions, you might also think about subconcussive impacts. You might also think about other physical harm, after all, the brain is part of the body, it's the part we're focused on, right? But you might think about other physical impacts from football. You might think about other sports. 
you might think, as some of the testimonies that some of you heard this afternoon, you might think about other family members and how they're affected by what happens on the football field, okay? So those are different populations that you might want to study when you look at things from a public health point of view. All right. So when we look at football, what is the goal? What are we trying to do? So some people would say, right, raise the provocative question you raised, should we abolish football? And there's that graphic with football and a line going through it, right? That's probably not going to happen, okay? I'm going out on a limb, all right? So then the question is, what should be the goal short of that? And when we think about things, again, from a population basis, we would say to reduce the incidence of concussions and other uh, traumatic head harms, injuries, and the severity of the injury when the concussions do occur, okay? So those are achievable public health goals, and most of what you're hearing during the day really is relevant to those more modest public health aims. We're not really hoping or expecting to, to do away with football, although we might change the culture in, in a way that makes it more of a niche sport. So how might we do that? And what I've identified here are five different things, I think is a technical term, things you might look at as a way of reducing the burden that concussions cause. And I'm not going to talk about equipment because you did that uh, very ably, um, but we could talk about changes in rules, we can talk about changes to the culture, and then perhaps not as obviously we could talk about lawsuits and compensation as ways of doing public health as well. And for any of these, you can imagine kind of a whole spectrum of interventions. So another thing about public health to keep in mind, right, is that we have a range of different choices. So when you're thinking about helmets, right, the most benign choice would be just give people information about the different helmets, right? That's one very sort of modest public health intervention. You might also say there have to be injury standards. Right? That's, that's more sort of, uh, sort of interventionist. Depending on who imposes those standards, it could be more or less interventionist. You might say the NFL, the last time I checked, there were a bunch of different helmet uh, manufacturers that players could choose among. All right? So a more coercive thing would be to say, no, this is the only manufacturer and this is the only helmet you can use. Okay? So you can imagine a whole different range of, of uh, responses. So I'm going to go through, except for equipment, I'm going to go through each of these four uh, with a briskness and alacrity that will astonish you. <laughs> All right, so with apologies to Bill Maher, here are some new rules. Uh, and on the right side of the page, we have uh, uh, rules that, that really at every level of professional, all the way down to youth football, or as we might say, youth football, really is a way of minimizing the incidence and the severity of, of concussions. So the first thing we might do in the NFL is to really put emphasis on decreasing the incidence of helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact. And there's been uh, a real effort to do that. Right? The understand I mean, part of the problem was as the helmets got better, instead of becoming safety, they became weapons, right? So people smashing into each other at high speeds, Right? And the evidence shows that the stationary players, right, the line, are at much less risk than the players who are moving at high speeds, for reasons, of course, you can, you can imagine, on account of the biophysics. Right? Uh, the NCAA has a rule that says when a player's helmet comes off, they have to be taken out of the game. There are some exceptions to that, but that's basically the rule. And they have limited the number of full contact practices within the NCAA, the Ivy League, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, has taken further steps. I think you can only have two full contact practices there. And youth football, uh, now they're saying at the Pop Warner League that most of the time has to be spent on non-contact drills. Uh, on the left side, and if I had uh, more time, I think I'm going to skip this step, I have a uh, little chart that shows you something called Law Atlas. And by the way, if you're doing research and want a shortcut, lawatlas.org is a great source. They are a compendium of different laws that are relevant to different public health issues. And you can see a map of the US. Oh, what the heck? We'll just click on it for a sec. I know I've got you all excited about it now. Uh, and so here it is, right, Law Atlas. And you can go to a particular state and click and of course nothing happens, but in theory what would happen <laughs> is it would give you a list of the relevant laws within that state that are uh, 
uh, that state's attempt, right, to limit the damage from concussions. And what I found most interesting when I looked at Law Atlas was that the states of Texas and Louisiana were the states that had the most uh, laws protecting against concussions. I suppose that's an acknowledgement that, you know, football uh, really is king in those, in those states, okay? All right. So we look at things from a public health point of view, right? We don't just want to, well, we're going to try a lot of different things, but not everything is going to work. Some things are going to have unintended consequences, right? So uh, what we want to do is to uh, design interventions that we think might make some sense. Maybe we've got some good scientific research. Uh, then we want to do a population analysis. We want to look at whether these things are actually working. All right? And right, based on that, we'll decide, well, is this something we should keep, extend, modify, or scrap? Because while we thought this was working, really it isn't. All right? And one of the concerns I always have is when a new issue is identified, like concussions, there's this spate of things that goes into effect, only some of which are likely to have any effect, and very often they're not studied as rigorously as they might be. So again, the public health prizes a, an empirical uh, response, okay? The next thing we might do, and again, this is public health in sort of a more subtle guise, is to change the culture. And you might ask, what will football look like in 20 years or 40 years? So here in the photo, I have people playing flag football, all right? Now, I don't think that's about to happen anytime soon, but you can imagine something like that taking hold at the youth football league. A level where you know parents are going to say I don't want my kid to play contact football they can learn many of the same skills why don't we have some kind of alternative to that instead of doing away with youth football completely we might do something along these lines uh, one of the things to recognize about the changing of culture is there is this risk if you're a football fan I suppose I would characterize it as a risk uh, that it will go the way of boxing. And the way that happens is it happens over a period of time, right? It doesn't happen all at once. So just like with smoking or getting people to wear their seat belts, it's a combination of law and public service announcements and just people's perceptions changing over a long period of time. Uh, what about litigation as public health? In the, hour, in the minute 45 seconds I have, this is not usually thought of as a public health uh, measure, but it can be. So I'm going to look at the settlement very briefly, uh, and it's been provisionally rejected, but I assume that in some guise or other it's going to be approved. Um, so one of the good things from a public health point of view is that there's money in a settlement to underwrite a further research. Relatively little money, but that's a good thing from a public health point of view. And the medical exams and compensation, which I'll return to in a second. The bad thing about the litigation is that there is no disclosure of the internal documents. And we could have a whole other discussion about these promises of silence that take place in contracts and settlements and the cost of those to society. But one cost of the settlement is that these documents that might have been useful in further prevention at lower levels will probably never come to light. And speaking of compensation, uh, is compensation a way of doing public health? All right? We don't usually think of it that way, but it can have some effect along those lines. I've done a lot of thinking and writing about compensation. Um, they can provide an important source of funding, usually private funding, in service of a public health goal. So I tend to agree that litigation is not the best way to go here, but, but carefully crafted compensation funds might be. And one thing a compensation fund can do is to look to future injuries, look at people in a class of risk, all right, and establish medical trust fund, all right, so for medical monitoring. So you can't prevent the primary trauma, but you can arrest maybe some of the sequelae if you, if you develop good testing and intervention. Um, unfortunately, my time is up. I will just summarize by saying it's, it's not ap applicable probably to high school players and younger, and I think uh, that's a reason why you need to do, you know, more primary public health prevention there. And finally, Again, just to return to this original idea on slide number 11 for those of you scoring at home, is that we have to look beyond football and concussions and look more broadly at other sports, at physical safety, and kind of a broader rethinking of the value and the place we give not only to football but to sports and the broader culture. So thank you.
Thank you to all four of you for fabulous presentations. Um, first, I think we should do a very quick lightning round. Um, if any of you have a question you would like to pose to any of the rest of you, this is your opportunity. I'll start with you, Sai, and we'll just go this way. Do you have any questions you want to ask of the others? Uh, yes, I want to ask the, I'm sorry, the, the, last, the last speaker. Oh, hey. Thank you. Uh, so you, you uh, were pointing at some of the changes that the uh, NFL was, uh, was making in the game. Yes. Uh, minimizing helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact and things like that. Do you, can you offer a public health perspective on whether those have substantially mitigated any of the risk, uh, the concussion risk, from playing pro football, or whether I, they're cosmetic? I, that's, that's exactly the right question to ask, and I don't know the answer to it. I don't know if the research has been in yet, but it seems like an easy enough thing to study, right? And as far as I'm aware, I haven't, I haven't seen any data, but, but it does seem to me that that's exactly what you want to know if you are doing something like this, you know, if for whatever reason the incidence of concussion went up, I can't imagine how that would happen, but if it did, you'd want to sort of change that right away. Dean Roberts, any questions for any of the others? No, I'll pass. All right. Russell? I'll pass. <laughs> Professor <laughs> Colhane, I know you can't pass up this I, opportunity. So I wanted to ask, uh, I have a a funny question for you and then a serious question for you. So the funny question is, I, and I shouldn't think of it this way, when your brother went into a tree, it sounds like the plot of Ethan Frome. I mean, I, I just don't know if anybody in the audience is aware of that book. We had to read it as kids. But, but uh, what I wanted to ask is when you said litigation wasn't the best way of handling this, do you think that that compensation funds are a better way to go in these cases? Well, I don't know, but I, that's certainly, I think, something that we as a society ought to think about with respect to sports in general, when, when, whenever there's a high risk of injury, the tort system places blame. And, and it says, you've done something wrong. And it encourages people to, to look to blame somebody else when in fact, that's not the real issue from a public health standpoint that we ought to be looking at. We want to, we want to create a system that discourages people from engaging in unnecessarily risky behavior. And we want to provide a system for helping people who suffer the consequences when, when the risk goes bad. But litigation is an expensive and inefficient way of doing that, I think. I want to piggyback off that just to suggest that, and this is something that uh, Steve Packman uh, told me this morning when we were discussing after his talk, um, a whole lot of the litigation that occurs um, on negligence grounds against schools and entities um, is actually triggered or prompted by first party insurers, by the Blue Cross Blue Shields of the world um, who want to find another entity to pay. And so if they can get the school system's insurance to pay instead of them, uh, all the better. And that's why so much of the litigation, all the costs <coughs> that go into the depositions, the costs that go into um, uh, expert witnesses and whatnot. And so just sort of piggybacking on that, it seems to me that perhaps if the first party insurers um, had perhaps higher standards or said, okay, we'll insure you if you've educated the coaches, if you're using uh, up-to-date equipment, um, that kind of thing, then maybe we could get rid of a lot of the litigation and, and simply have the first party insurers uh, taking care of those, uh, those financial costs. Yeah, somewhere way back in my education, I remember being taught that we want to internalize costs to the activities that give rise to them. And so the NFL should be making a generous annual contribution to a compensation fund of some kind. Certainly the BCS people should be making generous contributions uh, instead of all the money going to coaches, some of it should be going into a compensation fund to help uh, people who are, who are injured, not just with concussions, but all kinds of injuries. Um, as a practicing lawyer and a plaintiff's lawyer, perhaps I could provide a uh, <laughs> complimentary perspective. Uh, first of all, there is generally a tendency among defendants to say that litigation is bad and we ought to have you know, a better scheme for compensating the victims and that this is not ideal, and then that scheme never happens. Okay, so it's great to say that such a thing ought to occur, everyone didn't get together, they should design it, they should put money into it, but when that happens, you know, pigs will fly past your third story window. 
The second thing I would say is, I agree 100% with your point that the, you know, the NFL ought to put money into a, a comprehensive insurance scheme, but in the relatively isolated case of NFL football and retired players, that's what the pension, the disability pension scheme is, okay? It's a private insurance scheme that is supposed to, on a no-fault basis, you have to prove a connection between pro football and your injuries, supposed to pay you a very healthy compensation. And it's money that comes from the players' pockets. It's part of the, the compensation that the, you know, the NFL teams pay out each year. And the problem in the Webster case, and in successive cases, is that they weren't playing by the rules that they had established. And they should play, you know, play more fairly. Everything ought to work in a better way. But right now, the only way to improve the functioning of the system is to sue them and get them to you know, perform better. So I, I agree in principle with a lot of the things that you were saying. But in, in the real world, it doesn't always work out that way. That's at least my narrow, jaundiced perspective. But by the way, in the Webster case, the biggest objector to paying Mike the higher pension benefit level were the union people and not the league people. Because I, mean, I know, Todd talked to Dick Burleson about the Webster case at some length, and, and it was their view that when the pension plan was set up, it was specifically designed to, to help people with physical disabilities. Um, you can say that's a ridiculous interpretation, or that, but it was the players who were worried about money being siphoned away from other players. It was not as much the owners, uh, but... Well, you, you don't know because there, there's a, it's a Taft-Hartley plan. There's an equal number of players and management right. people, you know, on this retirement board that makes the decisions. And, right. And, and it, it may well be that in particular cases the players voted a certain way. We don't, we don't have a split on all the votes. So. I do. Well, uh, I tried to get one, and, uh, you know, through legal discovery means, and if you were more successful, I'm very happy. Well, no, I just, I used to represent the NFL, and okay. so I'm fairly okay. familiar with how that all played out, so... Well, I think we have about 10 minutes for audience questions. Um, so now is your opportunity for those of you who'd like to raise something with our wonderful panelists. Yeah, at the back. Seems like the coaches are going to have a, a heavy hand in the culture in, in the future as we go forward. And what's happening around the country now is that places where people interested in sport and sport education and kinesiology, et cetera, that's starting to be subsumed under public health. Uh, it's a whole new chapter, I think, for public health. And it seems to me that there could be a sizable portion of sport leaders in the future who understand performance, probably have the win, you know, winning attitude but they also have a public health perspective in their background. And, and that may help to change the culture that, that, they're, that there's this balance of winning at all costs and at the same time protecting those assets, which are, which are the athletes. And I'm thinking about as we project, you know, 20, 30 years down the road. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I mean, with football in particular, there's such a deep cultural entrenchment of a certain way of looking at the sport, right, that, uh, you know, wouldn't allow flag football at the youth level even now as an acceptable substitute, right? On the other hand, you know, one of the panelists said, you know, moms are not going to let their kids play. It's also true of dads. I have a friend of mine who played football uh, in high school and college uh, and loves football, thinks it's a great sport just from an athletic point of view, said he would not let his son play football, knowing what he knows now, um, at least if it stays the way it does. So I think, uh, and I'm not taking a position on that, it's just, you know, it's just interesting how there's already a change because there's so much information out there. And, you know, I think as people tend to look at things from a public health and policy perspective, you will get some changes just in the call. It may accelerate something that's already happening. Uh, Professor Colhane, you mentioned this briefly in your presentation, and Mr. Smith, you asked about this briefly in your lightning round. Um, your question was whether uh, we have any data discussing how effective the, the methods the NFL is taking to reduce concussions, how effective that is. And the answer, uh, if I remember correctly, was that we just don't have the data, right? Yeah. So my question is, what do we know? What data do we have besides, like, what steps actually work 
uh, besides something as extreme as getting rid of football or getting rid of contact? What are some other steps that uh, teams can take to, that are known to work? Well, let me f first speak to the difficulty of getting the data. I mean, as you know from these high publicity cases, it can take, you know, decades for the long-term effects of traumatic head injury to be fully revealed, right? So with these steps, you can, you can assess short-term gains or lack of gains, or you can look at it down the road. And I think one of the advantages of a public health perspective is you would look at the population of, of pro football athletes, and you would even break it down you know, further, as some studies have done, right, to look at various different positions on the field and figure out 20 years from now, you know, in light of these changes, what kind of results have we seen? Um, so I think those are the data that are going to be, you know, revealing. The only other thing I wanted to say, and this may be my only chance to say it, is even though it's not at all responsive, um, but, it, but it does go to the question about litigation versus compensation of plaintiff defendant. You know, there are times when, you know, if it turns out that the NFL, as was alleged in the complaints, right, uh, you know, knew about these risks and kept them secret or created this sort of shadow, dummy, sciencey thing to, you know, to like the tobacco industry, to make it sound like there was no problem. If that had turned out to be proven, there's an important effect that the tort system has in terms of deterrence that can also do public health by discouraging not only this actor but other actors from taking, from taking actions that we don't want them to take from a, from a risk reduction s standpoint. So I just wanted to get that out there. You got me. Just to give a little uh, response to that last question, I, I believe the league actually intervened with uh, rule change, say, on the uh, moving the kickoff forward as an intervention to reduce the number of kickoff returns. So in the year preceding that, there were 210 concussions in the league. In the year afterward, there were 206. There was no statistical significance to that decrease. <laughs> Um, but I think it's interesting to, to me to see that the culture actually changed so that if you're nine yards deep in the end zone, you're going to run it out now, which was not the case two years ago. So the league and the players have actually modified their approach and their whole risk perception and the motivation that they can now go 109 yards and get a bigger contract. It seems to outweigh the risk of potentially getting bludgeoned by 11 guys flying down it. But, you know, just a comment, the, the, the thing you have to keep in mind is when you're talking about rule changes, is that the, the, the American public, given our current cultural norms, want to see a particular kind of game. You could do away with the kickoff at all. You could just give, every, you could give the offense the ball at the 25-yard line without kicking it off at all. But people want to see the, the violence. They want to see the run back. And so the, it's a balance of how can you diminish the risks and improve the safety, but still keep the game the way that the public wants. Maybe over time we can change the public's perceptions so that they'll be more interested in safety and less about but the American public likes to see violence. It's unfortunate, but it's true. And it, it, it's a balance that's going to be tough to, to strike in the, in the short term, I'm afraid. Yeah, let, let me agree with that and say that uh, if the NFL's actions have not been 100% cynical, okay, then they've been 98% cynical. Because, you know, getting rid of the wedge, decreasing the number of kickoff returns, limiting helmet-to-helmet -helmet collisions, none of those are going to change the fact that in offensive and defensive line play, that these guys get hit really hard every time. There's a guy down at UNC who put accelerometers on college football players who are slower and smaller, and he found that in the course of a game, it's like being in a whole series of 20, 25-mile-an-hour auto collisions, but then a couple times a game, you might have a 35 or 45 mile an hour collision. That's every game, 
okay? And, and that's, that's going to go on regardless. That's part of the baseline, you know, violence in pro football. And you can like it or not like it. You can say there's assumption of the risk or whatever, but the, the balancing is not being done really with an eye to public health. It's being done with an eye to public acceptability now that the NFL has recognized that there is a direct connection between playing pro football and concussions and sometimes much later in life, uh, you know, brain injury. So right now that balance is not being struck on a public health scale. It's being struck on a slightly different scale. So I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative to throw out what I think will probably be the final question or topic for discussion, and we'll go around and everyone will get a last word. Um, this morning, our, our opening main speaker, Dr. Alan Faden, basically gave a presentation that many of you, even if you weren't here, are probably familiar with, that strongly suggested that all of these sub-concussive hits and insults to the brain uh, have cumulative impact that can be equal to greater than the single or even second or third concussion effect. Um, and it strikes me that the big lurking question that several of you in this session have touched on is causation. Causation is an issue in the employee benefits claim for the disability pension benefit. Causation is an issue in the workers' compensation claim. Causation is an issue in any negligence kind of tort claim. Causation is an issue um, with regard to products liability claims. In all of the, and of course many of you took torts with me, some of you didn't, but you all remember how important causation is and how it can be hard to establish. So my question, for, and I do think that this is the one area where the public health way of thinking about this sidesteps some of these problems, lets you talk about this without having to say how much of the 10, 20 years down the road physical and mental problems that an athlete or a former athlete has are attributable to their high school activities, their college activities, their professional sports activities, and so on. Um, but I think it would be really helpful for us to go, let's do it backward okay. um, and talk about causation and how it relates to these issues. So I've been thinking about causation since I was a small child. And, and <laughs> having taught torts for you know forever, probably about as long as you have, um, I think it's one of the most sort of fascinating issues in tort law. And when it comes to things like this, you could look at sort of general or specific causation. And so when I think about things from a public health or a population point of view, I'm thinking about them from the point of view of general causation. Could this impact or series of impacts have caused the problem? There, there have been studies done on youth where they say uh, that youth who have just moderate head injury, even subconcussive, are in at a very high rate of, of follow-up visits even a year after the initial impact, which tells you right, that if you're looking at the burden of the injury, you might actually have a higher overall population burden from the moderate impacts than the high impacts if there's a much greater number of the moderate impacts. So what you'd want to do is get your data lined up and figure out whether in general, this kind of impact over time can cause these kinds of harms. If so, you've got general causation. You don't have specific causation. The way I would deal with that would be through some kind of compensation fund. And that's, that's how I get around the, the issue of having to litigate individual causation in every case. Because the only other thing that ever happens is you get a doctor to invoke the talismanic phrase to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. And voila, it's transformed into a specific causation. So that's how I would deal with it. Um, slightly, slightly changing before I get to. Um, to get to that precise question. My wife accuses me of being a full-time uh, pole vault coach and part-time law professor. Um, I spend a tremendous amount of time with the sport of pole vaulting, and I've been on one of the ASTM committees looking at um, safety equipment of various sorts. Um, you know, once upon a time, people didn't have anything that they landed in. Um, then it was sawdust, and gradually it became these huge foam pads, and now we're looking at lots of different ways to pad the hard surfaces around where a pole vaulter might inadvertently fall and, and hurt themselves. So I th I'm thinking about causation in terms of the rule makers who get to decide what kinds of equipment need to be, um, need, need to be uh, present in, in an event. And I'm thinking about 
this morning, the sensors on helmets. At what point is a failure to say, to, a failure to mandate sensors on helmets? At what point will that be sort of like the radios on the tugboats that Learned Hand taught you about? And the, the judge is going to say, hey, you know, you, you got to have a radio on the tugboat or else you're negligent. At what point will it be if you're not supply, you know, putting the data from the sensors, making that available to the physicians and the coaches on the sidelines? Um, at what point when the person's hurt and uh, the coach hasn't pulled them out or they haven't had the, the data, at what point is that negligence? So failure to act can be a kind of uh, causation as well as, um, as well as misfeasance or um, actually trying to injure someone. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I guess I would agree with, with John that, that, that this brings us back to the compensation fund, con, fund concept. I mean, in tort litigation, you either win or you lose. And I'd rather have a system whereby you didn't have to prove specific causation. Somebody's got this kind of problem when they're 50 years old. They played football. We don't know which blow did what, but we know that that was a, a significant contributing factor. The compensation fund ought to kick in. But I, I would also agree that the, the compensation fund's not going to happen voluntarily. It's going to have to be legislated because otherwise the NFL's not going to put that kind of money into a compensation fund, nor is the University of Alabama, nor is, you know, a state high school association, it's going to have to be done mandatory. But, but it seems to me that for sport in general, a compensation fund of this kind is the way to solve that problem. Well, uh, let, me, let me know one thing, and maybe this was discussed earlier when you had uh, actual doctors as opposed to lawyers who like to quote doctors um, appearing before you, but I, I did listen to a very interesting presentation by a guy named Dan Pearl, who worked for Boston University on what's called the Sports Legacy Institute, uh, which takes the brains of deceased professional athletes and then assays them to see whether they have, uh, as those slides showed in the public health presentation, whether they have signs of, um, of CTE. And he was recruited from there by the armed services to go to Walter Reed to deal with service members who had, uh, you know, been suffered severe concussions and, and often other types of brain injuries uh, from improvised explosive devices in Iraq and Afghanistan because it was a very similar type of enterprise from a medical perspective. And he showed some fascinating research that showed that. Um, that the effects of brain injuries and certain other types of insults on the brain have long latency periods, which means that you play football in your teens, your 20s, and your 30s, and then you go off and you, know, you do other things in life, and then suddenly when you're 55 or 60, often after a, a successful career, and there, there have been examples of this in the NFL, suddenly you know, your executive function that's housed up here in your, your prefrontal cor your frontal cortex of your brain is or the prefrontal piece of it uh, is disabled and you can't think, you can't organize your thoughts anymore. So that concept of latency makes it very difficult to tie into issues of causation. Um, you know, I'm really, I'm really not as informed about the youth sports and the college sports end of things. I'm really more interested in the NFL and, and other pro sports. If I look at the way that the NFL's compensation scheme is set up, it really is a lot more like what you guys are talking about. It is a, a private insurance scheme that is supposed to provide payments without necessarily allocating fault. It doesn't use the word substantial factor, which is a, a phrase often used in tort, proximate cause, and so on. But I think that it's akin to that in saying that if your disability results directly from, from playing pro football, or it results indirectly, there are different you know, tiers in the compensation, then you will get compensation. And, and I think that's an appropriate uh, way to, to look at it. And you know, it, we're not going to have a scheme like that in college unless things change very dramatically. We're not going to have it in youth sports, period. Uh, but that, that's, to me, is a fair way of paying this stuff out. And you don't get a tort-type recovery. You don't get a, you know, a $5 million recovery unless they you know, deny your benefits for a multiple of years and you get back benefits, retroactive benefits. But you do get income replacement for a period of time, and, and that's a pretty reasonable approach to things. Uh, I think causation is going to be very hard, but if you think more about things as a substantial factor, you're going to get to fairer results on balance. If you have workable insurance schemes, those can be fair too, but they're, they're very scarce on the ground. So. I just, I just had one last 
quick point to make, which is there is a very a good compensation system in place for vaccine injuries, and there is a table that lists uh, a certain harms that are presumptively caused by certain vaccines. And if your harm is on that table, you recover. Uh, or the government's put to the, or the manufacturer's put to the burden of showing it wasn't caused by that. If the injury is not on the table because it's not something associated with that vaccine scientifically, then you've got the burden. Something like that, I think, is what we're thinking about in this case, uh, is that there be certain kinds of harms to the brain or maybe the body that we can really link to football presumptively and other ones that we can't. And John, but I, can yeah. I just add one thing? Uh, well, I'm a big fan of a compensation system to help the people who actually get hurt. I go back to your point that the tort system is probably an effective way of creating incentives for yes. the organizations to put in place reasonable rules to try and reduce. So, I mean, there's yeah, trade-offs the, here. In there's the vaccine case, you can sue if you lose in vaccine court, which I think was an important compromise that was reached. Well, with that, I think let's all thank our panelists for a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you for moderating so well. It was good. I thought it was eight years in the late 70s and early 80s. Were you in private practice or were you in the group? Oh, you have a So did you have Jeff Pash back then? Thank you very much once again for this final panel. Uh, of course, we typically do take a break, but uh, to consolidate a little bit of time, I think it's best that we jump right into our closing remarks. Uh, before we do that, I really just want to thank everyone, uh, all our speakers today throughout the day, um, and the students, my colleagues on the journal who uh, like when they get praised publicly, especially from me. Uh, but they've worked really hard today, and uh, for the past nine months, this has been going on planning. So a big thank you to them. Uh, and if you have any questions before leaving to our guests, please feel free to seek one of them out. Our closing remarks today will be delivered by Professor Robert Percival, the Robert F. Stanton Professor of Law and Director of the Environmental Law Program here at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. Professor Percival is internationally recognized as a leading scholar in environmental law and successfully built the environmental law program at Carey Law into one of the nation's top rated programs. In addition to environmental law courses, he teaches constitutional law, torts, and administrative law. Prior to joining the faculty, Professor Percival was a senior attorney for the Environmental Defense Fund, served as the special assistant to the first U.S. Secretary of Education, the Honorable Shirley F. Huffstedler, for whom he also clerked on the Ninth Circuit, and he also clerked for Supreme Court Justice Byron White. His scholarship has been published in the Washington Law Review, Fordham Law Review, the Maryland Journal of International Law, and the Alabama Law Review, among others. He is also the author of the casebook Environmental Regulation, Law, Science, and Policy, which is currently in its seventh edition. Professor Percival received his BA in Economics and Political Science from McAllister College and his MA in Economics from Stanford. He also earned his JD from Stanford Law School, where he was named the Nathan Abbott Scholar awarded to the graduate with the highest grade point average. But perhaps most important, importantly, and why he's here in part today, is that he is an avid sports enthusiast and fan. He's a big fan of the Washington Nationals, the area's other baseball team. Um, and he's been known in his constitutional law class to offer plenty of hypotheticals and examples in the sports-related context. Uh, in fact, in Professor Percival's constitutional law, one class I took during my first year, I was honored to win uh, a set of his season tickets to one of the Nationals games as a result of class participation. So it does pay off in the end. So it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Professor Bob Percival. Thanks. I'm sort of the uh, advertise special here, but because I'm a baseball fan, I know that the worst thing in baseball is to be the last batter at the end of the game unless you end up driving in the walk-off runs or something. So I'll be very brief. I, I really uh, appreciate the invitation to uh, speak here because it meant I uh, had an incentive to attend the conference, and this has been a fabulous conference, and I really want to uh, thank the students who put this together, uh, the fact that you had such a great group of, of speakers and experts here. Uh, I think one of the most interesting things about it is to see 
how the different disciplines are interacting to try to deal with this problem that we're uh, becoming more and more aware of. Physicians, scientists, medical researchers, entrepreneurs trying to develop better prevention technology, practicing lawyers, academics, uh, reporters, um, former players. Um, in my con law class is Colin Clority, and I, I noticed he was asking for the microphone just before Marley cut it off. Is there something you'd like to, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I, unfortunately, I had to miss your, okay. okay, I had to miss your presentation. Uh, many years ago, I had the privilege of uh, serving as a law clerk to the best athlete that will ever sit on the U.S. Supreme Court, Justice Byron White. Uh, in many ways, I, I believe he sort of, uh, uh, the last great American hero from an era that we no longer have. He's sort of a classic American success story. Uh, grew up in, in uh, relatively modest circumstances in Wellington, Colorado, where he would uh, pick beets during the summers, but uh, was number one in his small high school class, and Colorado had a rule that that got you a scholarship and admission to the University of Colorado, where he became an All-American in football and basketball was the runner-up for the Heisman Trophy, led college football in rushing and scoring, and um, ended up then, uh, despite graduating number one in his college class and winning a Rhodes Scholarship, Art Rooney of what was then the Pittsburgh Pirates before they were called the Steelers, offered him twice as much money as any pro football player was getting at the time, so he delayed going to Oxford on his Rhodes Scholarship and was the highest paid professional football player of his time. But as a result, he had a target on his back. Uh, all the other players on the other teams would say that we can't wait to get a piece. He was making $15,000, which was an unheard of salary at the time. But it was in the era of where you had the leather helmets, and uh, he took such a beating, uh, but was the rookie of the year in pro football, led the NFL uh, in uh, rushing yardage, and is now in the Pro Football uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, one thing about him was he absolutely hated the way the press treated him because they gave him this nickname, Wizard White, because he was such a fast runner. And he absolutely hated the term Wizard. Unfortunately, the year I was clerking for him, one of my brain-dead co-clerks decided to adopt a cat that he named Wizard. And he would always come into the chambers and say, oh, you won't believe what Wizard did. And he'd say, shut up, shut up, if the justice ever hears us uttering that word, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, the year I clerked for him was the year that the book The Brethren came out, which was the first time that enterprising reporters had gotten a whole bunch of Supreme Court clerks to tell tales about what had really happened in famous cases. And White wanted to be able to truthfully tell the press that he was totally ignoring the book in the sense that he, he hadn't read it. So what he did was he assigned each of us to read a quarter of the book. He had four clerks and to write a detailed memo that reported on anything bad that was said about him uh, in the book. And uh, the worst thing that was said about him was Justice Stevens said that because he didn't seem to have any consistent ideology, uh, at his confirmation hearings, which talk about an old era, took 90 minutes. Uh, he was confirmed on a voice vote. The most significant thing he said was he believed the role of the judge was to decide cases. He didn't have any particular uh, ideology, but Justice Stevens had said he thought maybe he had taken a few too many knocks on the football field and that that had meant that he wasn't always consistent uh, in his decisions. Um, he was a really fierce competitor when uh, he would play basketball with his clerks on the highest court of the land, the basketball court at the Supreme Court. He often threw elbows, and when we'd have clerks reunions, uh, people would have broken glasses and other injuries. But what few people know is that after his retirement, and he retired as soon as President Clinton took office, uh, even though he was considered a very conservative justice in many ways, in that he descended from Roe v. Wade. He was the author of Bowers v. Hardwick uh, that uh, denied, uh, that said it was legal to criminalize homosexual activity. Uh, he had been the only appointee of President Kennedy and felt like he should have a Democratic president uh, replace him. But few people realize the physical decline 
that happened to him after his retirement. Uh, of course, I'm not privy to his medical records. He was an incredibly private person who personally destroyed all his Supreme Court records and fiercely fought against any books being written about him. But fortunately, uh, one of his clerks did a, a wonderful biography of him. But unfortunately, everyone believed that his physical problems late in life were the result of injuries that happened on the football field, the fact that he was just getting beat up uh, every weekend on the gridiron. And he would, for a while, we would have yearly clerks reunions, one in Washington and one in Colorado. He'd take the clerk skiing in Colorado, but quite quickly he got to the point where he just wasn't physically able to do that. And the very last reunion, the last time I saw him alive, uh, he no longer could even speak. And it was just so frustrating to see the smartest person I've ever met, this incredible mind, but due to possibly his uh, prior football injuries, uh, he was un completely unable to speak. And Janet Reno, the attorney general who he had befriended, befriended after uh, she came to Washington during the Clinton administration, was the master of ceremonies for uh, that uh, 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 event. Uh, but I think that what we've seen today through all these speakers is really a tribute to the way in which the various disciplines interact to deal with an emerging problem. Uh, we may question whether the tort system's the best way to deal with this, but in many ways there has a lot of parallels to the history of environmental law where problems that weren't known at one time, particularly those that occur with a long latency period, uh, eventually get discovered due to the work of here medical science, uh, our legal system, and the independent media in exposing uh, some of these problems. And as our knowledge of what causes foreseeable harm improves, what is a foreseeable injury changes. And so uh, as a result, the legal system can end up creating incentives for people to do the right thing to deal with this issue. Sports is many different things to different people. To some, it's a game. It's kind of scary to hear about how vehement some parents are now when their children play sports. Uh, to others, it's a business. To some, it's a religion. Uh, I was present for the uh, 2000, game seven of the 2003 American League Championship Series when the Yankees beat the Boston Red Sox on Aaron Boone's home run. And that was the first time it suddenly dawned on me, I now understand what Islamic fundamentalism is all about because of the level of intense dedication to you're either a Red Sox fan or a Yankees fan. To others, it's entertainment, witness the Olympics and how beach volleyball is now an Olympic sport, baseball is not, and the Winter Olympics have all these X games. Uh, sports enriches our lives, both as players and as spectators. We care about our heroes, and as their injuries become more visible, uh, the legal system and the other uh, uh, disciplines are responding. While I want my next car to be a self-driving car, I'm confident that uh, we won't get to an era where we're going to have our professional sports uh, played by uh, robots. Clearly, our culture is changing uh, more in the direction of, of protection of public health. And while uh, I must admit that I think kickoffs are a lot less entertaining in the NFL now uh, today, I think people understand why we're moving in this direction, and it's certainly a good one. Thank you.